understanding climate change. Hey, welcome to the Greenhouse. I'm Alex. This is a special video for GSA 2021 and for anybody who wants to learn more about kitchen climate science. Turns out that the basic science of climate change and mitigation strategies like renewable energy technologies are easy to explore with simple kitchen implements. Come on, let's take a look at that. For example, measurements of temperature, mass, volume, and time are all routinely made in the process of cooking a meal. These measurements are also fundamental to understanding the quantitative interaction of energy with the earth and the flow of material through earth's environmental cycles. If you're familiar with our greenhouse video series, you've seen how we explore climate science and climate change solutions with really simple tools. I'm going to demonstrate two activities, both using kitchen implements. The first features a renewable energy solution, wind power, while the second explores a fundamental climate parameter, the thermal expansion of water. Okay, first, let's talk about a climate change mitigation strategy, wind power. And we'll do that by making paper pinwheels. The idea behind this experiment is to build the entire system from scratch, so no pre-made components, no black boxes, because when we construct the apparatus ourselves, we're also constructing our own understanding of how things work. So once you've got your pinwheel, we're going to stab that into the back of a pencil, right into the eraser. And then uh, don't get rid of the little piece of paper you cut off because we're going to use that to make a bearing that our pinwheel is going to spin around. Next, we need to make a frame to mount this on. We need something with space both in front and in back so our components can move, and we'll mount the bearing on top to hold the pinwheel. Anything you've got on hand is fine. Scrap wood is great, whatever's lying around the kitchen. You can go all sciency with a ring stand or bust out the Legos. Okay, so I'm gonna use Legos. I've got my wind turbine. I've put a smoothie straw in as my bearing, a little bit less friction that way. You mount the wind turbine. I'm going to add a little bucket to the back. Tie that on. Let's put a small mass in the bucket. How about a penny? And uh, turn on the wind. Awesome! Okay, so for young learners, that's all we need to do is show this qualitatively, that we can make this pinwheel do work and lift this mass. But for students who have more math skills, we want to add some math and some physics. And so we need to go to the kitchen and get some tools. We need to get our kitchen scale. We need a timer. Um, I'm going to use my phone. And then we've got to raid the kitchen junk drawer and get a tape measure so that we can measure the height that we're going to lift the mass. This is going to allow us to calculate the potential energy and also then by using the time to calculate the power. If I want to be uh, very careful about this, I would actually also measure the distance from the pinwheel to the fan to make sure that if I do this experiment more than once, I can reproduce it. Potential energy is determined by the height that we can lift a mass in opposition to gravity. Power is energy transfer per unit time. If we measure the time that it takes the pinwheel to lift the mass, we can find the power of the pinwheel. And of course, we're not going to do this just once. We're going to run a series of time trials with increasing mass to find out what the maximum power output of our pinwheel is. Notice that as we add mass, the power increases until we reach a performance maximum after which the power decreases and we find the critical threshold where the pinwheel can't lift additional weight. If you've seen a commercial wind turbine up close, you know that they're huge. Blade diameter and wind speed are the two important controls on power output. But you don't need to take my word for it. We can make pinwheels of different sizes and demonstrate this ourselves. The first pinwheel had a diameter of about 30 centimeters. Here's a smaller one with a diameter of 22 centimeters. 
and a large pinwheel that's 43 centimeters across. And here's the power of kitchen climate science. With the simplest possible tools, we've demonstrated a really important result. This gives us a great foundation to discuss wind power as a low carbon energy source and makes it clear why the newest wind turbines have a blade diameter of 236 meters. That's two and a half football fields. A turbine of this size is rated at 15 megawatts, enough to power 20,000 households. After demonstrating observationally that larger wind turbines generate more power, we can also approach the problem from the opposite direction and look at it purely conceptually. If we start with a kinetic energy of wind, 1 half mv squared, we can derive the equation for wind power. Here we see that because the radius is squared and the velocity cubed, turbine size and wind speed are the two most important parameters in determining the power of a wind turbine. Finally, one last bit of fun with math. Why does it always seem like wind turbines spin really slowly? These turbines, located in Iowa, have a blade length of 75 meters. You can time a full rotation. It takes six seconds. From that, we can calculate how fast the blade tips are moving, 175 miles an hour. Turns out there's nothing slow at all about these turbines. Okay, let's leave Iowa and head to the coast. And we'll go back to the kitchen and get some new tools and set up a different activity. This one's about energy in the ocean. It's an experiment about the thermal expansion of water and its role in sea level rise that can quite literally be performed on a stovetop with common kitchen utensils. Also, the consequence of thermal expansion is easy to understand and to apply to one of the most widely discussed consequences of climate change. Thermal expansion is the property that makes a thermometer like this one work. There's a reservoir full of alcohol connected to a very thin tube. When the temperature increases, the alcohol expands, forcing this liquid into the tube. The change in volume is proportional to the amount of liquid and to the change in temperature. The constant of proportionality is called the coefficient of thermal expansion. The coefficient of thermal expansion is the fractional change in volume of a material with each degree of temperature change. I'm going to skip most of the experimental setup this time so that we can focus on the results, but briefly, we're using a long neck bottle as a thermometer. We measure the temperature and the volume before and after heating a bottle full of water and use those to calculate the coefficient of thermal expansion for tap water. As with our wind experiment, once we've gained hands-on experience with measuring thermal expansion, we can take that knowledge and apply it to systems that are more interesting than water in bottles. We can look up coefficients of thermal expansion that are applicable to other situations, whether it's the seasonal expansion of the Eiffel Tower or the impact of increased ocean temperature on sea level rise. When we look up the coefficient of thermal expansion for the ocean, students can use that value to calculate sea level rise for a series of different temperature changes and replicate the results of the IPCC projections for different warming scenarios. We can also use these data to look at past and present sea level. For the ocean, we're going to calculate the change in volume for a particular temperature change. In this example, I've chosen two tenths of a degree Celsius. We also need to know the volume of water in the ocean, which we can look up and we'll use a coefficient of thermal expansion that's appropriate for cold seawater. Calculating the change in volume just involves plugging these numbers into our equation, and we've got our answer here, 4.76 times 10 to the 13th cubic meters. A much more interesting calculation would be to find the amount that sea level would rise because of this change in volume. We divide the volume by area, and we can find the amount of sea level rise, 13 centimeters, about 5 inches. So the math and physics of seawater tells us that if you warm the ocean, sea level will go up. There's no escaping this conclusion. We can put this number in context by finding the sea level rise due to thermal expansion for some other temperature changes, and then we could look at projections made by climate scientists that arise from a warming ocean. So here we've got 0.3 degrees C and 0.4 degrees C and the rise from thermal expansion for each of these. It's important to realize that if we warm the ocean like this, we're also warming the continents, and any ice stored in continental glaciers and ice sheets is going to start melting as the climate warms. So the amount of projected sea level rise is going to be partly from the thermal expansion of ocean water and the rest from melting glaciers, with thermal expansion causing just under half of the increase. These are projections from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for sea level rise by the year 2100, you can see that they range from 1.3 to 2 feet. The basic material properties of water are defined by equations, and those equations allow us to ask questions about the future and to make predictions. 
But is there any way to test those projections? The answer is yes. The physics of water is the same in the past, the present, and the future. So we can look at the past that we've already observed and see if that pattern fits our projection for the future. For example, there are tide gauges that monitor sea level all over the world. These are the current measurements on the east coast of North America. Let's go to Washington, D.C., here at the Tidal Basin and the memorials to Thomas Jefferson and Martin Luther King, Jr. The tide gauge tells us that sea level is rising just over 3 millimeters per year. We can also look at the record of past measurements made at this station. We see that sea level has risen 0.3 meters, or 1.1 feet, in 100 years. While one foot may not seem like a large amount, it's enough to have a serious impact on Washington's waterfront monuments. The one-foot rise in sea level now floods the paths and benches around the tidal basin at high tide, twice a day, every day. So think about what we've just done. Thermal expansion is easy to measure in a soda bottle in your kitchen, but it's important for people who live in coastal communities all over the world. Simple quantitative experiments address some of the biggest hurdles to understanding climate change, and they give students hands-on experience that prepares them to pursue really important scientific or societal questions. There are lots of ways for students to explore these ideas with really simple tools. And we've got some more examples of this on our YouTube channel that you can access with the links at the end of this video. Hey, looks like that pie's ready. I'll see you next time in the greenhouse.